satellite audience, so I need to explain to you a little bit about what's going on in Orlando. Here in Orlando, there has been some kind of power outage coming into the facility here. So although this microphone works directly out to the satellite audience, it does not work in-house. And uh, if you're watching via satellite, you'll notice that the lighting is a little dark and I may have a few shadows on my face. That's because we are using auxiliary power, auxiliary lighting. Our staff is pushing the cameras around, but we are on air and we are doing well and God's gonna give us a great meeting tonight. Tonight our topic is Jesus, Jerusalem, and startling end time prophecies. One of the favorite cities in the world that I visit is the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is almost like the mother of all cities. When you come to Jerusalem, it's like whoever you are, it's like going home. Jerusalem has four major quarters. There is the Christian quarter. You can enter in through the new gate to the Christian quarter. And here's the Christian quarter here. You can come into the Mar to the Arminian Quarter through the Zion Gate. You can come in through the Damascus Gate into the Muslim Quarter, or you can even go in through Herod's Gate. You can come into the Jewish Quarter through the Dung Gate here. So four quarters, Jewish Quarter, Arminian Quarter, Christian Quarter, and Muslim Quarter. The Temple Mount is here, and it is upon this mount today that we find the al Ask Mosque and the famous Golden Dome of the Rock. Coming into the, coming into the temple gate here, you'll notice something very interesting as we return to where we were. Okay, here we go. I'm ready to go now. As you come into the, through the Golden Gate here, this gate is actually sealed up. You can no longer enter in through this gate. The reason for that is that many, many years ago, that gate was sealed. In front of this gate, you will find a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery. Our Jewish friends believe that when the Messiah comes, he will enter in through this golden gate. And as he does, the gate will be opened again, and everyone who has died, those Jews who have died, will be resurrected from the dead as he comes through that gate. Now it is this Temple Mount that is the center of activity. It's the Temple Mount that is the center there of unusual, unusual conflict between the Jews, our Israeli friends, and the Arabs. Now you will notice here that here is the Western Wall. Here at the Western Wall, Many of our Jewish friends will come to pray, and they believe that when the Messiah comes, the Messiah will come and bring glory and splendor back to Israel again. But right above the Western Wall is the Dome of the Rock that sits on the place that the former Jewish temple built in the days of Herod sat. So this Western Wall is the last portion of Herod's temple that remains after the destruction of the temple by Titus in 70 AD. You can see the proximity of that temple to the Western Wall. Often as I have been there, there have been conflicts. Those conflicts have taken place at times when stone-throwing Arab children have thrown stones down at worshipers, there's been a conflict back and forth, tear gas. So this place is a very volatile place today. Temple Mount is a place that's very sacred to our Muslim friends, where the Western Wall is a place very sacred to our Jewish friends. Will Earth's final war break out in Jerusalem? Many Christians look to Jerusalem and they say Earth's final war is going to break out there in Jerusalem. Is the invasion of Jerusalem by enemy armies a sign of the end? There are many people that believe that a sign of the end is that enemy armies are going to attack Jerusalem and that when you see those enemy armies enter into Jerusalem, you know that that indeed is a sign 
of the last days and a sign at the end. Now, Jesus talked to his disciples about a coming destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus lived, of course, in the first century, and his ministry ended in the early 30s, 31 AD. Jesus talked to his disciples. He talked to them about a coming Holocaust on Jerusalem. He talked about the Roman armies that would invade Jerusalem under Titus, the Roman general, in 70 AD. The Roman armies surrounded Jerusalem. And as they did, they laid siege to the city. That siege lasted for many, many months. 70,000 Roman troops surrounded Jerusalem and laid siege. The siege lasted month after month after month after month. Josephus, the Jewish historian, describes the devastating effects of the siege this way. The best friends would often come to blows over a small piece of bread. Children would often rip food from their parents' mouths. Neither brother nor sister had mercy upon the other. A bushel of corn was more precious than gold. Josephus goes on, driven by hunger. Some ate manure. Incidentally, there are instances in that siege of Jerusalem that the hunger was so bad that some parents boiled their children and ate them. Notice what Josephus, the historian, says during the siege of Jerusalem. Driven by hum hunger, some ate manure, some the cinches of their saddles, some the leather stripped from their shields, some still had hay in their mouths when their bodies were found, some sought to escape starvation by means of their own filth. So many died of starvation that 115,000 corpses were found in the city and buried. Ladies and gentlemen, the attack of the Roman soldiers on Jerusalem was a gruesome and it was a devastating attack. Jerusalem, of course, was burned. Thousands died. The Romans occupied the city. When Jesus told his disciples about the destruction of Jerusalem, the disciples thought that an event so cataclysmic, so destructive as the destruction of Jerusalem, they thought that must be the end of the world. This is the burnt house the first time I visited the burnt house was probably 15 to 20 years ago. The burnt house is a house that the archaeologists uncovered in the 1970s. And as they uncovered this house, it had the ruins of the first century destruction. So you can see firsthand this house of an aristocratic family that was burnt burnt to the ground in the first century when Titus attacked the city of Jerusalem. The disciples came to Jesus, and as they did, they said, Jesus, an event as cataclysmic, an event as destructive as the destruction of Jerusalem, that must be the end of the world. So the disciples said to Jesus, Matthew 24, verse 3, let's read it together. Matthew 24, 3. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So the disciples thought that when Jesus was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, he was talking about the end of the world. Jesus was a master. Jesus then answered the disciples' question, what will be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? He answered that question by blending two events. He told the disciples the events that would lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, some 40 years in the future. But those events would be miniature events. Those events would be a microcosm, if you please, of the greater event that would take place, the greater events that would take place just before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in Matthew chapter 24, we have signs that would not simply lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem, but we have signs that would lead up to the end of the age or the end of the world. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus outlines more than 20 signs of his return. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are two things that I want you to be aware of tonight. One, no one sign constitutes the end of time. But when you see all the signs 
taking place all the time, converging together, you know that the end is near. Secondly, nobody knows the day or the hour of Christ's coming. If somebody says, Jesus is coming in 2009, you know that they are pretending to know more than Jesus said it was possible to know. So Jesus does not give us in his word a date for his coming. Jesus does outline signs. And tonight we want to review those signs. Signs of the return of our Lord. Signs that were in miniature before the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century and signs that would lead up on a universal scale magnified to his second coming. There are signs in the world of religion that Jesus gave. There are signs in the world of politics that Jesus gave. There are signs that Jesus gave that are in the world of nature, natural phenomena that Jesus said would take place before he came. There are signs in the world of society, in the world of morality that Jesus gave. No one sign constitutes a sign of the times. But when you see all the signs taking place all the time, you know that the coming of Jesus is near. Tonight we're going to look at those signs. Tonight we're going to review what Jesus himself said about end events. Jesus first said, there will be false Christs and false prophets. In other words, an explosion of all sorts of, all types of, all manner of false religion. Jesus said, read it together with me from the screen, please. Matthew 24, verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. So Jesus said there will be a proliferation of false religions. There will be a proliferation of false spirituality, false Christs and false prophets. Men would arise, women would arise saying, come, follow me. I am indeed a messianic figure. Jim Jones there in the 70s and 80s, you remember Jim Jones was quite a popular religious figure in San Francisco. He had a large evangelical church and Jim Jones held up the Bible one day and as his followers were looking at the Bible, he said, don't look at this. He said, look at me. But ultimately they did look at him, but looked at him too long. He led them to the jungles of Guyana where there more than a thousand, almost a thousand committed mass suicide. Time magazine called it the cult of death. Jim Jones wasn't the only cult leader that would arise in America recently. Think of David Koresh, who said, I am the Lamb of God, the tragedy in Waco. Some time ago, I interviewed one of the followers of David Koresh, who was in the compound at Waco and left two weeks before the fiery inferno of death. And he told me that David Koresh, indeed, pretended to be a cult-like messianic figure. Or think of Marshall Applewhite. Time Magazine talked about inside the web of death. Heaven's Gate cult, Rancho Santa Fe, California. Marshall Applewhite believed that a, after the hale bop comet, that there would be a saucer-like ship that would come to Earth and deliver the followers of Marshall Applewhite, but they were led to mass suicide here in Rancho Santa Fe. Each of them had a buzz crew cut. They had their black shirts on, their black pants, black uh, jogging shoes, black case at the bottom of their bed with their passports on their bodies and their identification. Now, the interesting thing about this is this. When the police finally received the message that this mass suicide had occurred, and the word got out within a matter of a couple of hours. The police station in Rancho Fa Santa Fe, California, received over 1,500 phone calls from parents whose children had joined a cult and the parents didn't know where their kids were. The Bible said false Christ and false prophets. We see that taking place around the world. Think of Japan, Shoko Asherata, the cult of doom. 
Again, cults are rising up faster than mushrooms in a Florida rain in the forest and a spring day. Here is a cult that rose in Uganda, thousands following that cult. As I travel around the world, there is no doubt about it. False Christs, false prophets, false spirituality that indeed is taking place. Books on magazines and movies and on the occult are selling in multiplied millions. You see, if you cast off the Bible, if you cast off belief in, in God, the heart still seeks for spirituality, and it goes down a pathway of deception. The modern occult Wiccan, pagan, and Druid religion, according to the American Religious Identity Survey, ARIS, the modern occult Wiccan, pagan, and Druid religion is now listed among the 10 largest organized religions in the country. Teens especially are attracted to these occult movements and outnumber older converts by three to one. Did you remember, did you recognize that the occult is one of the top 10 religions in America today? Jesus said false Christ. Jesus said false prophets. Jesus said the rise of the occult in spiritualism. According to the website www.cultlink.org, an estimated five to seven million Americans have been involved in cults or cult-like groups. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus' prediction about false Christs and false prophets is coming true before our eyes. It's coming true in our day. The total number of these cult false religious groups range from between 3,000 to 5,000. There are approximately 180,000 new cult recruits every single year. We are living at a time when prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. Now, counterfeits are not always easy to recognize. For example, take the New Age movement. In the United States, during the last 10 years, the number of people who identify themselves as belonging to the New Age movement increased 247%. The New Age movement believes in the idea of God within you. They believe the idea that everybody is God. Jesus said false Christs. Jesus said false prophets. We see that taking place before our eyes. The prophecies in the world of religion and politics are coming true. What did Jesus say about the civil society? What did he say about this political world in the rise of nations around us? Jesus talked about war. And Jesus said this, Matthew 24, verse 6, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now somebody says, wait a minute, pastor. How could wars be a sign of the end? Haven't we always had wars down through the century? Haven't we always had wars in every generation? Notice the Bible doesn't say there will be a war. Jesus says you'll hear of wars and what? What does it say? Rumors of wars. In other words, wars on an international scale. Remember, no one sign constitutes a sign of the coming of Jesus. But when you see all of the signs taking place, together and combined, you know that the coming of Jesus is near. Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Jesus predicted just before the end, there would be international conflicts on a global scale, on a scale that is unprecedented. He said that the conflagration of war would break out. Read it with me, please, Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Not a single war, but wars on a universal scale. The 20th century was the bloodiest century of all. In the 20th century alone, there were 165 wars that killed more than 6,000 people. Five of these wars claimed more than 6 million victims. There were 180 million deaths from war alone in the 20th century. We had World War I and World War II. For the first time in the history of humanity in the 20th century, we had World War I and World War II. We had the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Indochina conflict, 
the Iran-Iraq war, the Middle East conflicts, and tribal wars in Africa. But think about the 21st century. We're only eight years in to the 21st century, and we've had the Second Congo War, We've had the war on terrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've had the Darfur conflict. We had the Israeli-Lebanese conflict. We had the Russia-Georgia conflict. Starting with the 20th century, 1940s, when we had World War I and World War, rather, the 1914 to 17, we had World War I, and 1939, 1940, and so forth, when we had World War II, we have entered into a period of a generation of war and Jesus said nation will rise against nation kingdom will rise against kingdom there'll be wars that prophecy indeed is coming true Jesus also discussed as did the other prophets that at the same time nations were arming for war there would be treaties for peace we would arm for war but talk about peace read it with me in first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3 let's read together for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and they shall not escape. So the ink on the peace treaties would be hardly dry. Opposing generals and opposing presidents and leaders and heads of state would shake hands, but they would shake hands, but within months and years, war would break out again. You remember well the peace treaty that Jimmy Carter initiated between Enwar Sadat and Mahakin Begin, between the Arabs and Israelis. But it wasn't too long after that that war broke out again. And then President Clinton, you remember that famous photograph at the White House where Rabin of Israel and Arafat of the Palestinians shook hands. It was a historic moment, but it wasn't long after that war broke out again. The Bible says they will say peace and safety, but then sudden destruction comes exactly as the Bible predicted. You know, the Treaty of Versailles took place June 28, 1919, after the First World War, leading to the League of Nations. The First World War was to be the war that ended all wars, but yet the League of Nations did not solve the problem of war. The United Nations was to be a confluence of, a union of nations that would solve the problem of war, but that does not happen. Let me hasten to add that we applaud every country's best efforts for peace. War is a very horrible thing, and often the innocent suffer in war. But we recognize as Christians that there'll never be permanent peace on earth until Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, comes. There'll never be peace on earth until there's peace in human hearts. There'll never be peace on earth until the one who is the rightful ruler sets up his kingdom, the prince of peace who will come again. Jesus said false Christs and false prophets. Jesus said false religions. Jesus said the rise of spiritualism. Jesus said wars and rumors of wars. Jesus said movements for peace. We see that happening before our eyes. The Bible predicted that Jesus would come at a time when the human race has the potential for nuclear destruction. Jesus would come at a time when the human race has the potential to destroy itself. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, written for the last generation of men and women to live on a planet called Earth, Revelation 11, verse 18. The nations were, what everybody? Angry and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, when's that, when Jesus comes, that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. Here's the time that Jesus will come to give out his reward. And those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy, what, the earth. A hundred years ago, did the human race have the capacity to destroy the earth, did they? Do we have the capacity to destroy the earth today? with our atomic weaponry, with thermonuclear weaponry. For the first time in history, the human race has the capacity to destroy itself. When the atomic bomb exploded on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, journalist William Ripley of Believe It or Not fame said this, I'm standing on the place where the end of the world began. 
scientists are concerned today. There never has been a weapon made that has not been used. In fact, Dr. Charles Ure, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry and member of the Uranium Committee on the Key Operation of U-235, wrote some time ago, I write to frighten you. I am a frightened man myself. All the scientists I know are frightened. Frightened for their lives and frightened for your life. Ladies and gentlemen tonight, why are the scientists so frightened? Because they know this generation holds in its hands the key to annihilate life on planet Earth. You see, it's not preachers howling on prophecy in Revelation that are so concerned. Scientists are. The nuclear club, designated nuclear weapons states are the United States, Russia, United Kingdom, France, and China. We also know now that India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons. North Korea probably does not. Israel certainly does, and Iran is working on a nuclear reactor. There never has been a weapon made that has not been used. A team of scientists from Rutgers University in New Jersey, from the University of Colorado and UCLA, made this statement on the devastating effects of even a small-scale nuclear war. They said, quote, even a small-scale regional nuclear war could produce as many direct fatalities as all of World War II and disrupt the global climate for a decade or more with environmental effects that could be devastating for, what's the next word? Everyone on Earth. That is a small-scale nuclear war. Jesus said he would come at a time when the human race has the capacity to destroy itself. This world will not be reduced to a spinning globe of ash. This world will not be destroyed in a nuclear war. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said, John 14, verse 1 to 3, I will come again. We need not fear the things that are happening around us because we are looking above us. We're looking to a new world, a new planet, a new society. We know that Jesus Christ will come and he'll come again. Popular Mechanics, front page article, when terrorists go nuclear. See, it's one thing for a terrorist to fly an airplane into the Twin Towers, but what if that terrorist hold, held a whole nation hostage because the terrorist had a nuclear weapon? Think of what would happen. Popular Mechanics, front page article, when terrorists go nuclear, and they said this, if a terrorist group or rogue state gets a hold of such material from smugglers, that's uranium. They solve the single most difficult problem in building a, a bomb. There is no doubt that sometime in the future, terrorists could easily build a nuclear bomb by assembling the right materials. Ladies and gentlemen, we need not fear. The Bible says men's hearts, Luke chapter 21, verse 26, are failing for fear. We need not fear their fear because we're not looking where they're looking. We see the same things. We don't stick our heads in the sand. Christians are not intellectual ignoramuses. We recognize the challenges of our time, but we believe that these are omens. We believe that these are signs. We believe that Jesus is coming again. One day he'll stream down the glory of the sky. One day the heavens will be illuminated with the glory of God. One day Jesus will come, and one day we are going home. Jesus said there'll be signs in the world of nature. Have you noticed recently, there's some amazing, quite incredible things that are happening. All of nature seems to be out of control. Jesus talked about famines. Now there always has been world hunger. Follow me closely. No one sign constitutes a sign of the coming of Jesus. But when you see all the signs taking place on a universal scale, you know that something is about ready to happen. Jesus said, Matthew 24, verse 7, read it with me, please. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Jesus said there would be famines. Every skinny child with bones protruding through taunt flesh cries out, 
Come quickly, Lord Jesus. There will be famines. The United Nations reported that there is a food shortage today in 38 different countries. In fact, one-sixth of the world's population are malnourished. Tonight, one out of every six children in the world will go to bed hungry. Jesus said not there would be hunger in one nation, but Jesus said there would be famines. 10,000 people every day die of starvation. 3.5 million people every year die of starvation. And the world is running out of arable land space to continue to feed the masses in our world. Jesus said there'll be famines, there'll be pestilences. Notice how Christ put this. Matthew 24, verse 7. There'll be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. What's a pestilence? How do we define what a pestilence actually is? A pestilence is a strange disease which afflicts human beings, crops, and the environment. So a pestilence can be a strange disease that affects your crops. It might affect the environment, environmental pollution, the pollution of waterways and airways, etc. Or it might affect the, uh, a disease that affects human beings. Now, if you know anything about orchards, you know this. 50 years ago, how many times did you need to spray the apples? 75 years ago. In the 1800s, did they spray any apples? The apples that you buy today, do they have any sprays on them called pesticides? Do the crops we eat have pesticides? Why do these planes fly over the crops and dust them with such health Full, healthful question mark after it, chemicals. Because if they didn't, the pestilences or the pests would eat up the crops. Would you agree with me that Jesus' words, there will be pestilences, so we need pesticides, that these pestilences are growing today, that you can hardly find anything in the supermarket that's not sprayed with pesticides. In fact, 2.4 million pounds of toxic pollutants cause an estimated 50,000 to 120,000 premature deaths a year just in the United States. We are belching smoke into our atmosphere. We're polluting our rivers. We are polluting our airways. We are polluting our food. Jesus said, there will be famines. There will be pestilences. These things are taking place around us. A group of scientists got together and they issued what they called warning to humanity. The scientists said this, no more than one or a few decades remain. Now this is not some preacher preaching from the confines of his church pulpit. This is not some ecclesiastical churchman preaching. No more than one or a few decades. What's a decade? What's that? Ten years. No more than 10 or a few decades, 20, 30 years, remain before the chance to avert the new threats we now confront will be lost. And the prospects of humanity, immeasurably diminished. Have you heard about global warming? The greenhouse effect, cars and industry emitting into the atmosphere toxic carbon pollutants? the greenhouse effect, the melting of the polar caps, the rising of the oceans, the warming of our climate, and the prediction that hundreds of coastal cities could go under? See, this is nobody crying wolf. You know, it's possible to live in a place like New York City among all of those police sirens that are going, whir, 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 and all among those alarms on the fire engines, and you get so used to those alarms and so used to those sirens, you sleep right through them. You know, those New Yorkers sleep so good that they sleep right through those sirens. I wonder, I wonder, are the alarms going off in the world and we're sleeping through them? Are the sirens blaring? Are the signs that Christ gave all around us, but we're missing them. They are there in the Bible. They're screaming at us every day. 
But that which is so unusual has become common. And we think the common is the ordinary when all of society is out of whack. These prophecies are being fulfilled. Another form of pestilences are the new disease that are springing up around the world. Have you noticed the multiple new diseases that are taking place? Mad cow disease, bird flu, HIV AIDS, Marburg virus, Lyme disease, West Nile virus. Pestilences, strange diseases on the crops. Pestilences, the pollution of the atmosphere. Pestilences taking place all around us today. The Bible says there'll be famines, there'll be pestilences, and there will be what? Read it together. There'll be famines, there'll be pestilences, and there'll be what, everybody? Earthquakes in different places. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. There's a lot of earthquakes. They will increase according to Jesus, and indeed, that is what's taking place. 35 new earthquakes every single day. 12 to 14,000 earthquakes every single year. This old earth is shaking. It's saying, Lord, it's time for you to come and deliver us. Earthquake in Sichuan, China, recently, May 12, 2008. One of the most devastating earthquakes that took place in recent years. 70,000 were killed. 18,000 missing. Earthquakes are taking place all around our world. The earth is rumbling, the buildings are falling, cars are being crushed, people are being buried alive in those earthquakes. The Bible says, Luke chapter 21, verse 11, there will be great earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and pestilences. Now notice this next one in the verse about what would happen in the weather. There will be fearful sights and great signs from the heaven. Fearful sights in the heaven, tornadoes, cyclones, hurricanes, one after the other in rapid succession. There would be an upheaval in nature that would be unprecedented and unusual. Think of the twisters and the tornadoes that we have been experiencing recently. 2008 has been the deadliest year for tornadoes in the past decade with 123 confirmed fatalities and 1.61 billion dollars damage to date. Now don't misunderstand. Merely because a tornado sweeps through a given community doesn't mean Jesus is coming. But when you see all of the signs, false Christ, false prophets, the rise of the occult and wicked and paganism, the rise of people claiming to be messiahs all over the world, when you see wars and rumors of wars, World War I, World War II, that litany of wars that we've gone through, when you see movements of peace, when you see the potential for nuclear destruction, when you see famines and earthquakes and pestilences, you know that the coming of Jesus is near. 2005, in the Atlantic hurricane season, they had mo the most named storms in history. You know how they do that. They start with A, like they go like, if they're doing girls' names, they go Abigail, Betsy, Carol. Well, in 2005, they went A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z. And they had a problem because the hurricanes were still coming and they ran out of the alphabet. So what'd they do? Well, they went back and they gave the double letters, started with A again. Think about Hurricane Katrina, costliest hurricane in American history. Or you think about the 208 hurricane season. There were seven hurricanes to date. Total damage, $52 billion. 883 direct fatalities, 999 indirect fatalities. You know, when you look at the cyclones, the tornadoes, the tsunamis, something is happening. It's different. Hurricane Ike, September 2008, just a month ago the third costliest cyclone in U.S. history. If you look at the tsunamis in the 90s, Mexico tsunami, Nicaragua tsunami, Indonesia, Japan, Mindoro, Irangira, New Guinea, Indonesia, Indonesia, Peru, there is something going on that is different. There's something going on that's unusual. All nature is crying out for deliverance. The Asian tsunami, December 26, 2004, one of the most deadly storms in the history of the world. A 9.1 magnitude earthquake killed over 230,000 people. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible said there'd be famines, there'd be pestilences, 
there'd be earthquakes. There'd be strange sights in the heavens. We see that being fulfilled before our very eyes. We see indescribable damage. Could it be that even this old earth is longing for deliverance, longing for the coming King, longing for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ? And today, Yemen floods leave 58 dead and 20,000 without shelter. I pulled this off the internet this morning. When you go home, you'll see it at CNN. It's happening as I speak today. Signs in the world of society. Now, Jesus moves from the world of nature. He talks about the world where you and I live. He talks about the world of morality. He talks about the world in the society that we live in. Jesus talks about moral decay. And as he's talking about moral decay, Jesus says, Matthew 24, verse 37 to 38, but as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be, like the days of Noah. Few people expected the flood to come. They said Noah is a, is a crazy, wild-eyed, old fanatic. The Bible says, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. What does that mean? They were eating and drinking. In other words, life was going on as normal. Life was going on common about them. They were eating and drinking. They were going to their sporting events. They had no clue. The things of time crowded out the things of eternity. The things of earth crowded out the things of heaven. Could that happen to you? Could that happen to me? The things of time crowding out the things of eternity. If there was ever a time to have your heart right with God, it's right now. If there was a time to open your heart to God and say, Jesus, I want to be ready when you come. Somebody says, wait a minute, he won't come for 100 years. You know, my friend, Pastor H.M.S. Richards, Sr. of the Voice of Prophecy, one night was preaching a sermon like this on the second coming of Christ. He was describing powerfully all the signs of the times, the false Christ, the false prophets, the wars, the rumors of wars, the movements of peace, the famines of the earthquake. Some old guy in the audience stood up, a guy about 80 years old, and he shook his finger at Pastor Richards and he said, Pastor Richards, Christ may not come for 100 years. Pastor Richards hesitated, looked at the old guy, 80, and he said, sir, judging by your age, for you, it's not going to be 100 years. <laughs> Put your hand on your heart. Thud, thud, thud. For you, the coming of Christ is not going to be 100 years. Because if your heart goes out in a heart attack, the next thing you know is the coming of Jesus. And the only way to be ready for the coming of Jesus is to open your heart tonight and be ready. The only way to be ready for the coming of Jesus is not getting ready next week or next month or next year, but it's saying, Jesus, I want to be your man. Jesus, I want to be your woman. I don't want anything between us. The Bible says they were marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, loose morality, sexual immorality was filling the days of Noah as the days of Noah were. And Noah called men and women to get ready for the flood, and we call men and women to get ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible says they're marrying and giving in marriage. It predicts the breakup of the family unit, the family unit that's been the basis of all society, a monogamous marriage between a husband and a wife. But the Bible says that before the coming of Jesus, that institution of marriage would be changed, divorce would be common, and other forms of relationship would be prevalent in society. There'd be a complacent attitude towards spiritual things, a loose attitude toward moral living. 50 to 75 percent of all marriages today end up in divorce in the United States of America. It's amazing to see how the devil has attacked marriage. Let me give you a word of encouragement. If for some reason you have gone through the trauma of a divorce and your heart is broken, Jesus Christ can repair your heart. Even if it was your fault, Jesus says, come to me. I want to forgive you because you made a mistake in the past does not mean you're doomed to failure in your life. Jesus reaches out to you tonight. And if you are the innocent victim of divorce and your heart is broken, Christ says, I can repair the broken pieces of your heart. The Christ that's coming again in the heavens can come again into our hearts and change our lives and make us over and make us new again. Loose morality. Here are births to unmarried women in the United States. 
you can see it clearly, 1960. Here's the chart in 1960, but look at where it is in 2004. The figures have skyrocketed today. Jesus described this loose morality in our society. The Bible says there'd be rising crime and violence. Rising crime, rising violence. We see that happening today. The Bible says, Genesis 6 verse 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Just like the days of Noah, wickedness in the earth that the every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. I don't need to describe to you the pornography of our age, the sexuality of our age, the sex slave trade of our age. I need not describe to you the immorality on television. I need not describe to you the mass media and the culture of immorality. Jesus said the thoughts of their hearts be like the days of Noah, the thoughts of their hearts, evil only continually. The Bible says the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. We see that today, a violent society. Here's a new report that has just come out, Re World Report on Violence and Health. It is the most comprehensive report on world violence. It came out in 2002 by the World Health Organization. Each year, more than 1.6 million people worldwide lose their lives to violence. Many more are injured and suffered from a range of physical, sexual, reproductive, and mental health problems. 1.6 million people lose their lives to violence. The Bible says it'd be like the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, the Bible talks about violence. And then the Bible, Bible describes this rapid violence. World Report on Violence and Health says violence is among the leading causes of death for people aged 15 to 44 years worldwide accounting for about 14% of deaths among males, 7% of deaths among females. So one of the leading causes of death for young people between 15 and 44 is violence. The words of Christ are being fulfilled in our generation. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, there were an estimated 1,408,337 violent crimes nationwide in 2007. False Christ, false prophets. Wars and rumors of wars. Movements for peace. Potential for nuclear destruction. Rising crime and violence, immorality. Famines and earthquakes and pestilences. And strange signs in nature. These signs indicate to you and me that Jesus is coming. That soon he will stream down the court of the sky. The Bible talks about economic uncertainty. I think I'll skip that one because uh, the economics today are so certain in America. Economic uncertainty. You want to see what the Bible says about this economic uncertainty? But look what it says about economic uncertainty right in the last days. James chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. Come now, you rich, weep and howl. For your miseries that are coming upon you, your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the what? Last days. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. And then the Bible goes on as it describes this heaping up of treasure in the last days. The Bible says, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fatted your hearts as in the day of slaughter. So the Bible talks about this movement of amassing wealth. And as wealth is amassed, it says, you've amassed that wealth for a day of what? A day of slaughter. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Revelation. Revelation 18, verse 17. For in one hour. In what? In one hour. Such great riches come to nothing. In one hour. In other words, there would be a sudden, there would be a certain, there would be a collapse of the economy. That economic collapse would take place very quickly. Now notice, the Bible does not predict that once that economic collapse takes place, Jesus is going to come in three months or three years. The Bible does not describe that at all. 
And I am not suggesting that the current economic collapse is the last economic collapse. But what I am suggesting is this. I am suggesting that the economic collapse that we have experienced is simply a prelude to a future economic disaster. What is God doing? God is saying to us, get ready, I am coming soon. What is Jesus doing? He is saying, do not put your security in money. Do not put your security in riches. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, be secure in eternity. Here is the national debt clock. Now, this national debt clock is incredibly amazing. 1989, the national debt was 2.7 trillion. In 2008, now follow this closely, in 2008, October 9, the national debt was 10.1 trillion. What's the date today? October what? 26. But from October 9, where the national debt was 10.1 trillion, until October 26, today, we pulled this off this morning, it is 10.5 trillion. We just cannot sustain a national debt that's so high. We are facing economic disaster. Bank repossessions, foreclosures of homes at an all-time high. What is God shouting at us? 401k retirement accounts, IRAs losing 40, 50 percent of their value, 30 percent of their value. What is happening? God is saying to you and me, their signs are taking place all around us. I am coming soon. Jesus is saying, there's one thing you can have confidence in, and that is my word. There's one thing that you can have confidence in, and that is that I love you and I care for you and I'm coming again for you. Confusion at IndyMac fuels consumers' anger. In other words, people put money in their banks, they should be able to trust the banks, but the banks have failed them. According to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, a total of 17 banks have closed their doors since the beginning of the credit crunch in August of 2007. This year alone, 15 banks have gone under. Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing to have confidence in is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing else. The signs are being fulfilled. False Christs and false prophets, fulfilled. Wars and rumors of wars, fulfilled. Cries of peace but no peace, fulfilled. Famines, fulfilled. Pestilences, fulfilled. Earthquakes, fulfilled. Sexual immorality, fulfilled. Homes falling apart, fulfilled. Violence filling our land, fulfilled. Economic uncertainty, fulfilled. There is a convergence of these signs. Jesus said, when you see all these things, know that I am near, even at the door. Where is Jesus? He's at the door. But he gives the sign, the final sign. He says, just before my coming, knowledge will be increased. Daniel 12, verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, that seal the book of Daniel, till the time of the end. Till what time? The time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, this increase of knowledge really is in two areas. First, the increase of scientific knowledge in the world. Second, the explosion of knowledge as the gospel goes to the world. Today, we know through science and technology that 90% of all the scientists and technicians that ever lived are living today. I mean, you think of computer technology. 50 years ago, the average kid knew nothing about computers, and today the average kid is a computer whiz. Think of the technological geniuses that are among our young people today knowing things that we never knew 50 years ago. Think of the books that are being published today, the scientific treaties that are coming out today, the scientific discoveries in really every area, medicine and uh, science and technology and industry and uh, 
as you look at it today, certainly knowledge is being increased. But that prophecy that talks about the increase of knowledge in Daniel talks about, it says, many will run to and fro, that is, many will leaf back and forth, many will turn the pages of the book of Daniel, and as they do, knowledge will be increased. The Bible says that knowledge of the end, knowledge of the prophecies, knowledge of Daniel, knowledge of Revelation, that there will be a great end time movement where men and women will come to a knowledge of the Bible. The Bible says, as waters cover the sea, so the knowledge of the Lord will cover the, cover the earth. And Jesus makes an incredible prediction about the explosion of biblical knowledge. Jesus says, and this is the last sign, this is the final sign, this is the end time sign. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom. See, Jesus gave all the signs, and he comes to the last one. He comes to the final one. He comes to the end one, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then, Jesus says, the end will come. When would the end come, everybody? When would the end come? When the gospel went where? To the whole world. Would you not think it's amazing that we can walk onto this stage and through satellite technology set a message up 65,000 miles in space in less than a second and have it come down to earth stations and circle the globe and people around the world can watch. Today, the barriers are being broken down. Today, the gospel's going. The gospel's going through radio. The gospel's going through television. The gospel's going through internet. There are people in Saudi Arabia watching by internet. There are people throughout the Middle East that are watching by internet. There are men and women everywhere today. No totalitarian regime today can keep the gospel from going forward because God has given us the technology to finish his work on earth today. Jesus is doing something unusual today. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end shall come. God is on the move today. China is opening up for the gospel today. My wife and I visited one of the largest Christian churches in all of China, 6,000 members. The gospel is going in China. We were in India not long ago and saw God's moving as thousands of Hindus were coming to Christ. We just came from Africa a few weeks ago, and I was at a large stadium in Johannesburg. 20,000 were there, whether it's Moscow, whether it is the former Soviet Union, whether it is the Ukraine, whether it's Eastern Europe, whether it's India, whether it's Africa, whether it's China, whether it's inter or South America, God is on the move today. Thousands are coming to Christ. They are following Jesus. They are being baptized. They are giving their lives to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Cuba. Can you imagine this? Recently, in Cuba, the government officials gave us permission for one of the first times in the history of the nation to have a public auditorium in Cuba. And thousands came, and they followed Jesus and were baptized. Tonight, around the world, the Holy Spirit is being poured out. Come with me to Romania and watch the moving of the Holy Spirit. Hundreds baptized in an Olympic swimming pool. We know not the hour of Jesus returning, but the signs all foretell that that hour is nearing. We know that Jesus Christ is coming again. We know that soon he'll break down the card of the sky. We know that our Lord is soon to return and we'll look up and we'll see him come. Listen as Jennifer sings, we know not the hour. signs all foretell that the moment is nearing when he shall return tis a promise most cheering but we know
Amen. Let's pray together. Wherever you are as we pray tonight, if Jesus came tonight, would you be ready? Is there anything in your heart that needs to be surrendered to Jesus? Wherever you are tonight, let him speak to you right now. Let him touch you right now. Say, Jesus, I give my life to you right now as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we're not in this world alone. We thank you that as we see the signs being fulfilled, we can look up and hope that Jesus is coming. He's coming to take us home. He's coming to enable us to live with him forever. So we open our hearts to you right now and surrender our lives. Take us and make us yours. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for coming tonight. I look forward to having each of you back with us for our next meeting, Echoes of Eternity. Good night. God bless you as we go tonight.